So there's this great question is sort of what exactly happens when the compiler takes your class that includes a type parameter and actually compiles it. And so let me show you kind of a simple mental model that you can use to kind of reason through what's going on here, right? Um, so imagine that I have this list class that accepts a type parameter E. You can see that as part of the declaration. Um, and then I create a list of strings. So it's almost as if we took this list class, we re removed the type parameter from the class declaration, and everywhere that we see E, which is the type of an element in this list, we replace that with string. So you'll see over here, uh, get returned uh, something of type E, which was a type parameter. Because I've created a list of strings, get now returns something that's a string. Same thing with set. Set took as a second parameter something of type E, whatever type I used to parameterize the class, and I replaced that with string. So it's almost as if you had written this code um, when a list of strings is created. Now, what about if I create a list of integers? Right? Well, I apply the same process. Everywhere I see E, first of all, I remove the type parameter from the list class, and then anywhere I see E, I actually insert integer. So it would look something like this. Now, um, I could have both of these in the same piece of code, and that's where things get very cool. Right? This is a conceptual model. It's not actually what really happens when the code is compiled. And it's actually sort of important that you understand how this works because it's definitely not what happens. So here's what the compiler does with those type parameters. It uses them to type check the code uh, during compilation. So if you create a list of integers, the compiler is now going to help make sure that anything you put in that list is an integer. And it's also going to automatically do the downcast for you when you pull something out. Awesome. Okay. Now, when the code is actually compiled, what happens is something that's called type erasure, which is that that type information those type parameters is stripped off. And really what happens is there's only one instance of every generic class that's created and it works with objects. So it's almost as if the compiler does those type checks and then puts in the casts for you automatically, but there's only one instance of the list. And that list, um, you know, because it accepts a type parameter and that type parameter is unbounded, can work with any type of Java object. So I can use this to store any type of Java object. If I use an unparameterized or a bare list, what I really get is almost as if I included object as a type parameter. So everything that I put in um, will be an object, it will be an object when, I, when it comes out. That's usually not what I want because I want the automatic type checking done by the compiler and the automatic casting that's done to make it more easy to work with the elements of the list. Um, so, so again, this type information is used, the reason it's called type erasure, is that the type information is used only during compilation, but then discarded when the code actually runs. So the compiler uses this information to check to make sure that I'm doing safe things with my list or whatever class I'm providing the type parameter to. Um, but then when the code runs, that type information is actually gone. Um, so, you know, again, and, and you might, th this mental model might encourage you to actually think that there's a different instance of every class created for every different um, type parameter. There are languages that work this way. Um, C++ with its template system, as far as I understand, actually does this. So if you use C++ templates, it's actually almost generating separate code for every different instance of the list, depending on which types of lists are used in your program. That's not what Java does. Java creates one list. So again, go back to my code. Java creates one list. That list works with objects, but the um, the casting is done automatically for you by the compiler. So, the, so like the casts are inserted. Um, so uh, let's look at, uh, we go through some of this in the lesson. Well, let's look at another example. So here's an example with two type parameters. A class can take two type parameters. Uh, we've seen examples of this. A map is an example of something that typically takes two type parameters because maps can include any type of Java object is a key and it's a value. So let's look at what happens when I have two type parameters. Um, so here, this is a map from string to double. String is K in this, and double is V. And so it's almost as if I had written this code, where everywhere I see K, I replace it with string, and everywhere I see V, I replace it with double. So my get method takes a key of type string, because this is a map from strings to doubles, and returns a double because the values are doubles. My put takes a key and a value, 
the key is now replaced by string, the value is replaced by double. So this is how it will work in the case where I have more than one type parameter as part of my class. But again, the key thing to understand is when the code is compiled, there's only one instance of my map class or my list class that's created, and it only works with objects. These types that are provided as parameters are only used by the compiler to check your code and make sure that it's safe. Now that's super useful. I don't want you to think that that's not important, but at runtime, the type information is no longer there. That's type erasure.